So thank you very much for the invitation in the first instance, and thank you very much for organizing this fantastic session. It was an absolute pleasure yesterday to listen to these great talks, and hopefully uh, I can also contribute to that in a small way. So what I'll show you today is a little bit of work uh, that we've done sort of over the last 10 years, uh, trying to understand how uh, small cells and small minerals interact with snow and ice and change a global process by enhancing the melting of snow and ice in our polar regions. And um, basically, I should try to figure it out. The first thing is I need to uh, acknowledge all those people who actually do the work. I am lucky when I'm allowed to go to beam time and spend some time doing research or when I'm, I'm allowed to go to uh, uh, the field to actually spend time outside. But I want to acknowledge in the first instance because this is a story of two parts. Uh, in the first part, I will acknowledge uh, the project called Black and Bloom, which was a Natural Environment Research Council Need OK funded where I spent Quite a lot of time in the UK before I moved to Germany, and it was co-funded by the Helmholtz uh, Society, where I'm now at the GFZ in Germany. I want to acknowledge all the postdocs, Steffi Lutz, Jenny McCutcheon, Joe Cook, Andrew Tadstone, Chris Williamson, a bunch of associate PhD students, which I don't have time to go into details today, and obviously all the PIs. And then uh, 2020, uh, COVID year, we started with the project called Deep Purple, which is an ERC Synergy grant, uh, which I have together with Alex Anesio and Martin Tranter. And there, over the last two COVID years, we have exploded a number of PhD student and postdocs, and I'll present at the end uh, some of their work, but I'm not mentioning them all because it's too many to mention, but they do the work, I have the fun. And But basically what I want to show today is I was uh, extremely lucky uh, as a master's student to have the chance to go to the first time to the Arctic. At the time, as a geologist, I went to study rocks underneath glaciers or around glaciers. But even since then, and unfortunately, I have to say this is now three decades ago, I went back again and again because it's one of those magical places that you want to go back once you have experienced it. But the changes that I've seen have been tremendous. Uh, glaciers disappearing, uh, islands appearing where there used to be just ice. And obviously, this doesn't just affect the local population because their way of living changes uh, and the, the biology, the sort of like the macro and the mi microbiology, but actually it has massive implications also for the global uh, systems because of the melting of increased melting of snow and ice and the link to sea level rise. Now, as a geologist, we are not surprised because glaciation happened through geologic times. And those of you who have been yesterday at Kurt's talk, he actually referred a little bit to the Proterozoic uh, cryogenian so, uh, domain, which is basically when we had our whole planet was full of snow and ice, we had the snowball earth. So in the Proterozoic, we had the cryogenian, but actually even in the last sort of 500 million years, we always had hot houses and cold houses. That means we had domains in our planet where we had in millions of years or hundreds of million years, we had colder or warmer period. Over the next couple of slides, I'll slowly bring you down to today to see how this is affecting it. So if you look at last 500 million years in the uh, Proterozoic, we obviously had at the beginning, before we had the advent of land plants, we had a lot of CO2 in our atmosphere. Only when the gymnosperms and the angiosperms colonized our planet did we actually have a drawdown of CO2. Yes, these are big numbers, big variations, because this is based on proxies. But if you look back in terms of the temperature proxy, for example, the oxygen as a top uh, composition, you actually can see that we had glacial periods and hot periods again over millions of years. I'm now bringing it back to even less than million years. I'm bringing it back to one million year, which is the Epica ice core. And they just started drilling the beyond Epica ice core, which will bring us down to another half a million year back in time. And when you look at the left-hand side, you have uh, CO2 in blue and methane in whatever this color is, orange. But just look at the CO2. The variations over this million year is somewhere between 200, 200 to 275, going up and down, glacial integration, glacial integration. So relatively variation, which is expected in geologic timeframes, even now that we go down to 1 million year. The problem is we are today already going in a in a direction which is far outside the one million year rhythm and in the future it's even worse. So if we now just look down at the last glaciation here and what you see on the left is the northern hemisphere and on the right is Antarctica. 
This is 26,000 years working backwards to see how the Northern Hemisphere ice shield, which was huge, has dramatically disappeared. And we remain with where we are now in Greenland. But what you see in Antarctica, there is also loss, but much less. But the important thing is that if you look at the timing here is at about 17K years, it starts going very fast. And then basically within about 10,000 years that the, almost all of it disappears. If you transform that into a two dimensional plot, now we have the eustatic sea level rise and these years. Obviously the North American continent has contributed a lot, North American melting of the ice has contributed a lot, but all taken together, in this whole period, you had a sea level rise of 130 meters. Now, all this was precipitated by a change in temperature of four to five degrees Celsius. Over this whole period of time of 10,000 years, where the change was dramatic in all of the places, we had an ice loss of about 3,000 gigatons per year. In the pre at the beginning of time, the value here was about a tenth of it, so about 300 to 500 gigatons per year. But actually, when it was in the fastest rate, it was 3,000 and sometimes even higher. Remember the 3,000 versus 300 values a little bit because we'll come to that later. So where are we today? And by today, I mean in sort of like recorded history. So we had ice cores up to uh, 1958, and then we had Mauna Loa, where all of a sudden the measurements is are going up very fast. And this is our downloaded that from the killing curve from this the last measurement from November 13, 2021. We are at 460 ppm. And in the last three decades that I have gone to the Arctic, basically this is the fast increase that we see. So that means in this period, the rate of increase has changed. It's not the fact that it happens, but actually the rate is unprecedented. And I'll just show you Another way of looking at this, because this is a fantastic uh, heat map from Ed Hawkins, where he basically plotted the years from 1850 to 2015 and the months. And in every single month and every single year, slowly but surely, the temperature goes up. And in November 2015, globally, we have surpassed one degree pre-industrial. What does this mean? Uh, actually lead to? Well, it leads to sea level rise. And this is now global sea level rise. And this is an uh, animation from Kevin Pluck from Pixel Movers and Makers, where he calculated in 140 years how the sea level rise has changed and what the total contribution on global sea level rise is. So in these 140 years, we have added 22 centimeters of sea level to the global ocean. Now for uh, places like London or Berlin, maybe 22 centimeters doesn't make such a huge difference, but there are millions and millions of people live, living in coastal cities where 22 centimeters is a lot. And if this accelerates in the future, it's actually not very nice. So if we then look at it now, just from the point of view of Greenland, because the rest of my talk will be specialized mostly on Greenland and on, on the Arctic parts, We're talking a little bit about Svalbard, a little bit about Iceland and Northern Sweden, but mostly about Greenland. Greenland itself today has 1.7 million square kilometers of ice cover. And in parts, especially in the center, it's up to two, three kilometers thick. If all of this would melt at whatever rate it melts, we would add six to seven meters of sea level rise. I'm not taking on Antarctica because if Antarctica would melt as well, we have a much different problem, but I'm just remaining at the moment in Greenland. How do we know this? Well, we have satellites and satellites are magical things which are blipping in the sky and they measure a lot of things. So one of the things they measure, they measure the mass change, that means the gravity change uh, over Iceland, over Greenland. And what you see here is these are seasonal variation. So summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter. And you see the change in mass over Greenland. This is just 10 years here, but it's actually continuing because now there is a new satellite, which is called Grass, uh, Grace Follow-On. So what you see, if you put this into a two-dimensional plot, again, you see the amount, this is gigatons of ice. It adds in this period of time, one millimeter per year. It adds an accelerating mass loss. In Greenland, we are just below three degree Celsius. We're not talking one degree Celsius. We're not talking 1.5. We're not talking two. We're talking in the Arctic, we're already very close to three degrees Celsius pre-industrial level. 
and we approach in a critical state and tipping point. Now, in this particular period of time, remember I mentioned the 300 and 3,000 gigatons per year? We already are at 250 gigatons per year. And if this continues on, we are actually crossing the tipping point and the critical state and we'll be in big trouble. Why is that so difficult? Well, the measurements also show that if you think of all the stations which are existing around Greenland, they measure temperature. And if you count all the days where the temperature is above zero, the cumulative melt days, the annual average is increasing. So between 1979 and 2007, across Greenland, the annual average was about 40 to 45 days. And in 2012, when I had the luck the first time to Greenland, actually we had 97% of, of Greenland was melting at one particular time. And we had 75 days of uh, melting in 2012. This is not, it was an exceptional year, but even in 2021, where you now see, this is the map from 2021, the melt days were still, the average melt days were more in the like 60 days. And also in 2021, we had a huge proportion of the Greenland ice sheet, more or less this whole half, and including summit, which is 3,200 meter altitude, we had rain. So some of you may have seen the recent news that actually rain makes a huge difference because rain will enhance the melting because it's, if it's below freezing, it actually creates ice layers and or especially where we were in the south this year, we had 145 millimeters of rain in one day. Now, for those of you in the UK, in the rainy places, you know that 145 millimeters is even beyond what you normally expect. The problem is, it's very difficult to make these kind of mass balance calculations to actually predict how this happens in the future. If you want to look at the green and ice sheet surface mass balance predictions, you can get anything if you go from, let's say, up to 2300, you get any kind of possible prediction on any kind of scenarios you take from the IPCC. The reason is that albedo, which is the amount of light reflected, again, measured from satellite, is the biggest uncertainties. And I'll show you why. If you think of albedo measured at the moment, just in the last two decades of the previous century and in the first decade of this century, you just, just look at the scale here. You're going from green to blue in a very, very short period of time. So this change is dramatic. In trying to understand why this is, people look at the ground. So most of you who go skiing, you assume this is the way uh, the surface looks like, and it's all nice and white and fluffy. But actually towards the end of the season, the, especially the peripheries of any glacier that you see and of the green and ice sheet is actually dark, very dark and very black. And what you see here is basically the remnant of uh, uh, snow and then darkness. And I will show in the next couple of slides, a series of increasing spatial resolution pictures starting from a satellite image where you see this dark band on the Western side of Greenland and this is a surface melt and this is the dark zone. And this has been seen now for many years. It, it develops every year, but actually more and more we see it also in the Southeast. We have potential tendencies also in the North, but from satellite, it's always a bit difficult because of the cloud cover that you have and other properties that you have to figure out. But we see this dramatically. And if I now go to a 30 kilometer scale bar here, where I have the bare ice, the very, very dark zone, you see the little lakes here and the snow line. I'm bringing it up to one kilometer. And this does not look like what people think of clean snow and ice. This is actually very dirty surfaces. You see, again, the lakes, the rivers, bringing it down to 50 meters. You see the rivers, you see still hummocks of little white patches. But actually, as you go down now to 10 centimeters, you realize that at any scale you're looking at, whether you're looking from the satellite or whether you're looking at a centimeter scale or even sub-centimeter scale, you have dramatic variations across all length scales. So that means to parameterize something like that is not easy. But still, we still don't know what affects the albedo because if I measure albedo on a square like this or a square like this, I will get very different values, but I need to know what changes the albedo from here to here. So how do we go from here to here? The first thing people thought, well, it's simple, it's snow physics. It's basically the properties of fluffy snowflakes to become wet. We all know that if you go from clean fluffy snow to slush, it actually changes the properties in the darkness. 
this dry wet transition, if you think of albedo as one, actually reduces the albedo to let's say down to 0.95 or 0.75, but it's totally insufficient to explain the change from here to here. The second thing, which again is included in the global models is black carbon. And I'm putting black carbon in quotes because depending whether you have anthropogenic fossil fuel carbon or you have wildfire carbon, the properties of that soot is different because it goes from a variety of black carbon or optical properties. This is included in climate models, but included based only on spring snow and only on the optical properties. We know nothing about the chemical reactivity. We know nothing about the fate. And also from the spring snow, we know nothing what happens in the summer when the big melting happens. But the black carbon in snow is again, reducing albedo from one to 0.95 to 0.7. Taken together, it doesn't work. And regardless, now we've seen in 2017 for the first time Greenland burning, which was an exceptional case. But we have burning every year in Australia, California, Siberia, you name it. The, the third parameter, which is again, not included in, in climate models yet, but it's, it's working on it, but we know even less about it, is obviously mineral dust. Regardless whether you take mineral dust from the Sahara and you deposit it somewhere, or you take the more and more, what happens as they shows retreat, you leave in front of it an Arctic desert. And this Arctic desert is full with glacial flour, which is very, very fine material, which actually is super dry. It's picked up and actually redeposited. We know very little about it. We know nothing what happens in the summer. We don't know what the albedo reduction is because basically we know very little about the optical properties of the different minerals that are there. And specifically because the optical properties of minerals are very often known only in the pure system, not in their combination like they are in a place. But we know nothing about the albedo, whether if we take mineral dust, black carbon, snow and ice physics, what happens? We know nothing about it. But dark is not just dark because of water, black carbon, and minerals. It's also dark because of biology. So if we think about uh, one of the things which is uh, also working towards darkening the surface is the fact we have uh, photosynthetic algae, which obviously are either green or if they form pigments, they form, for example, carotenoids. That means they make them red. This, this is the snow algae domain, where in the snow they grow from uh, green to yellow to red. Or on the ice, they go from basically purple to, to dark brown, but these things are not considered or included in surface mass model, um, models, although in the summer, when there is temperature above zero and there is melting, that's the fastest changing parameter. The soot and the minerals, they don't necessarily change, but the biology changes there. So when we started, we tried to ask the question, who is there, what do they do, and how do we ground truth this? Because the problem is if you just measure optical properties of black carbon in snow or mineral composition and mineral optical properties or uh, pigmented microbes, these are all together called light absorbing particles. But if you measure them individually and in lab conditions and not together and in field conditions, it's very difficult to actually find a way to upscale this at the scales as I showed you and include any of these components in predictive models. So big part of the work that I will show you now is how we actually understood primarily pigmented microbes a little bit about these in what happens in Greenland. And what we do is we went with black and blue, we went to these two places in, in Greenland and we have our little camps on the field, we have our little lab tents and mess tents and field tents, and we go and actually collect everything and measure sort of everything we can. That means we need to ask ourselves, what comes from the air? What deposits onto the ice? What happens during the melt season? And what happens once the stuff is maybe or maybe not transported down? So I'll start with what happens from the from what comes from the air, because obviously we always have snow and or dry deposition. It means wet or dry deposition. And very often now the wet deposition is both snow and ice. And this is work done by Jim McCutcheon and uh, Steffi Lutz as the postdocs and together with uh, Jim McQuaid from the University of Leeds as a collaborator. So we used a lot of different sensors and filters to measure the rates and evaluate the rates and flux of deposition of microbes, black carbon, minerals, and nutrients. And combining that with meteorological data, we can actually see where this comes from and what the rates of deposition are. 
And I'll just show you a couple of examples because we collect the biological particulates and we collect particulates on transmission electron microscopy grids or on silicon nitride grids for synchrotron stixum analysis. And you've seen some of the stixum analysis yesterday or some of the spectroscopy analysis yesterday in a variety of talks. So I'll just show you a little bit about black carbon. In Stilly's talk yesterday, you've seen the tobostratic uh, uh, carbon uh, signals that he was showing in his meteorites. We have carbonaceous nanoparticles with these tobostratic onion ring st structures as well. Note, we are now down at five nanometers. So we need to try to figure out how we can include something which is five nanometers all the way to an albedo value. And that's not an easy thing to do because you need to measure the properties of these particles from the point of view of their degree of what is called the degree of graphitization or hybridization. Because if a pine tree burns, it will have a different light absorption property than if it's a fossil fuel burning. And only by measuring the exact properties, either with synchrotron stixum or with eels in the, in the microscope, can you get a value which you then can transform in albedo. The same way is when we look at mineral dust and microbes, and I'm sorry for whatever reason, the scale bar of this uh, uh, picture disappeared, but obviously this is a, about three micro micro. And we have all the things which are transported in the air. They come from a variety of places, and I'll show you how we worked out what the source is. And we have a bunch of microbes, and it's primarily bacteria. We have only algae uh, transport only for short distances. So from the air, we have quantified what is delivered. But now we try to figure out what actually happens on the surface. So what you see here, these are humans for scale. This is a drone image where we go from snow to a slush period and then to very dark ice. So this snow to ice transition is what we are trying to figure out. And I will start with a story about what we see in snow. So the snow ecosystem, again, this is work from Steffi Lutz. We go from, first we develop what is called green snow. These are chlorophyll rich algae, these are chlorophytes. And then as they are exposed more and more to light, they develop the pigments because they need to protect themselves against the high UV radiation. It's the same way like, you know, we put sunscreen on, they are smarter, they make their own sunscreen and they actually change the color of the snow quite dramatically. So we sequence these to actually try to see who is there. And I'm just showing you the graph. You've seen a couple of these graphs yesterday, and this is uh, 18S rRNA uh, sequencing. And the only thing you need to take home from here, these are all chlorophytes, mostly all green algae, but actually that the purple part is dominating in most of the samples. These are samples from a variety of places. So actually within the snow habitat, compared to many of the other plots that you see, we have a very low uh, diversity, which means that actually these are fairly adapted. And what we've shown with the work on snow is that across the Arctic, regardless whether we, uh, we take samples from the diversity, low and very similar types of algae uh, classes actually uh, dominate. But we wanted to see what they actually do, what are the pathways, so what are the metabolism, how do they actually produce uh, their pigmentation. So we started looking at uh, snow algal metabolism pathways, and it's not, it's not easy because uh, you first need to figure out how to look at metabolism uh, over a, a period. You take, let's say, you take two different colored snow. Yes, naturally, you will find different metabolic pathways. But we started with first of that. And what we saw then in the green snow, the primarily metabolic pathways are dominated, not surprisingly, by growth and development stages degradation. For example, tryptophan or carbohydrate, uh, ribose and lactose kind of uh, uh, sort of metabolic pathways. In the red snow itself, which is more towards once it's already developed the pigments, we actually is mostly to uh, metabolic uh, signals for storage, where we see that we have, uh, basically we have single lipid biosynthesis because the lipids in the snow algae go together with the pigments. But we still, we can try to figure out what actually happens. So we said, okay, let's try to figure out whether we can sequence the whole thing in the, in the shotgun metagenomics. And we run into a big trouble because Although we can use the metagenomes from, for this is now again, it's a green snow and red snow bag from a very special place in Svalbard. 
we can know who is there and what they're doing, but we can only have in the NCBI genome database, we only have uh, 22 algae and only one of them, the Chlaminomonas reinhardii, is the warm water cousin equivalent of us, but it doesn't actually work because we have nothing about cryogenics. So then we thought, well, how to solve this uh, in order to actually use the metagenome data better and any metatranscriptome or metaproteomes, we need to actually get the reference genomes. So we worked together with a cryo collection here in Potsdam, it's Thomas Leia, and actually he cultured and uh, worked with us to actually look at five cryophilic strains from culture collections, which have been isolated, many of them from Svalbard or from, uh, from Greenland, and actually are the closest relative to the most abundant algae that we found in our samples. Now, I think yesterday, most of you, uh, and possibly even today, looking at the abstracts, will talk about bacterial processes or archaea processes. And when you think about that, you think about big genomes being maybe three, five, oh, if it's big, you're talking 10 megabases. Our problem is that the predicted estimated genome size of our algae is the smallest one we have is 50 megabases and the biggest one is 1100 megabases. So we are currently a bit stuck and we're working together with Sabia Marchand and the Joint Genome Institute and also with uh, Alex Anesio in Arbus and his team to actually try to uh, get the algal genome sequence properly and actually figure out how to combine short and long read sequencing in order to close these large genomes. And we are now focused on mostly one, and at the moment, uh, the, the nanopore sequencing is, the, the, is still the bottleneck to make proper libraries for these, but we are getting close to that. So that means we know what they're doing. We know we have transcriptomics data and also proteomics data to try to figure out what actually happens and what are the processes that they have, because we know they're there, we know they change color, we know they affect albedo but we don't know actually what triggers them. If I now go to the other end, from the snow all the way to the ice, the purple ice, remember we go from very clean ice all the way to ice with lots of specks, and this is 25 uh, centimeter bar here, and you see that actually the snow themselves, the ice themselves habitats is now dominated by what we call glacier ice algae. These form a pigment, which is called purpurogallin, which is very much like a tannin, like what makes your tea brown. And they are mostly ancylonema and mesotanium. We don't know whether they are two different ones, but I'll show you in a second the sequencing data from that. But actually we have, these are filamentous ones. They form chains of two, four, eight, or 16, or even longer, 32, or individual ones. And when you collect them from the ice and you filter them, because you melt ice and you filter and you get these little cakes of material, which is obviously a, a lot of it is actually minerals, about 95% of it is minerals, and up to, let's say, between 1 and 10% you have organic carbon. When you put them under a microscope, what you see, and this is now a scale bar of 500 microns here, you see that they are actually these little blabs, which we think is because of the way we actually collect the samples, we have to melt them and then filter them. But nevertheless, we evaluate what goes through a filter to actually find the particulate loading by habitat. Because depending on the particulate loading and the composition of these particles, we can then determine what the effect on albedo is. So if you look at particulate loading, and this is work by Janine McCutcheon, which you'll see in a moment, in terms of nanograms of particles per grams of ice, you see the scale bar here is logarithmic. You see that in early season, clean snow, it's never super clean, and we have two different fractions here, filtered to 0.2 to 5 micron above 5 micron. You see that you have a value, let's say about, this is about 5,000, you get to 10,000, but then when you get to high algal biomass ice, you get to close to 100,000 particles, sorry, nanograms of grams per ice, it's quite a lot. If you now remove the organic matter and just look at the minerals, all of the minerals are actually dominated by far, we're talking a huge proportion, the biggest proportion is actually very, very small particles in diameter. And it makes sense because this was, these were samples from about 30 kilometers off uh, of the ice margin. And that means everything transporting for this kind of long distance to aerosols has to be very large. We have a couple of big particles, but many of them are actually very small. But what do they do, the glacial algae, 
who are they and what do they do? This is, we sequenced them. This is Steffi again, Steffi's work. And then basically Chris Williamson looked at the chlorophyll and the carotenoid composition of these to try to measure and evaluate how they develop the pigments and what the pigment is per cell. So we know who they are and the diversity of that is even less than in snow algae. The difference between what we found in what is called ancylonem and mesotinium is one base pair. So the purple glacial ice algae are extremely low diversity and extremely well adapted to living on the ice. But still the question is, what do they eat? Well, we've done some experiments, and this is again work by Chris Williamson and Janine McCutcheon, and it's published in, by Janine's paper in January this year, where they looked at the relative electron transport rate and forget about what it actually means, but it's actually the amount of stuff they take off. So here we fed them with nitrogen species and aqueous phosphorus. And you'll see that the phosphorus, the purple line, is the one which actually is the, uh, dominating the whole process. So actually any phosphorus that we give them, they eat up like there's no tomorrow. But then we thought, well, where do they get that phosphorus from? So we analyzed what happens actually in the minerals and they actually biomine the phosphorus from the minerals. And we thought, well, where is this from? There is very little phosphorus in the samples themselves, but it's enough. This is a, a very careful uh, X-ray diffraction quantification where most of the samples, you see they are the classic, the, of course, the feldspars, which actually don't have a lot of albedo effect because they are the translucent. Then we have the amphibole, the peroxines, but then we have the hydroxyapatite and the organic matter. And hydroxyapatite is just very small proportions. But even these small proportions, and this plot, what you see here is the mineral phosphorus and the total organic carbons is actually a very good correlation. And regardless of whether you plot this against total organic carbon, total organic nitrogen, or total organic phosphorus, the link in the solids versus the mineral phosphorus is always one-to-one. -one. So that means you need a little bit of phosphorus to extract from the minerals. In the moment it gets solubilized, it's actually eaten up very quickly and taken up in the biomass. But then we ask ourselves, where does the mineral come from? So we analyzed as big geologists, we analyzed the rare earth element composition. And what you see here is ytterbium yttrium versus lanthanum samarium. And they are very typical locations where it could come from. So it could come from African dust or let's say Asian dust, or it could come from Greenland itself. So our samples plot within the Greenland domain. It doesn't mean we can't have a little bit of effect from Asia or from Africa, but actually most of it, and this is where we have sampled, most of it comes from the forefield. It's brought up from the forefield onto the glaciers, like I showed you before, where the glacier flower is deposited more and more. The local provenance of this matches, in our case, the Greenland mythologies. That means it's a local uh, process itself. But is there enough of these algae growing on these minerals to make a difference? And this is uh, started long ago by Alex Anesio, and this again is in, in the work of uh, Chris Williamson, where we looked at a uh, rate of photosynthesis as a function of uh, algal bloom density in this particular case. And for those of you who work on uh, lakes or rivers, if you look at the primary production in micrograms of carbon per liter per hour, you see that the values that we have in our high algal density sum is actually almost equivalent to a eutrophic lake. So actually it's a quite a good biome to study because actually on the long term, if the surface area of Greenland becomes darker and darker as in the warming climate, that is an important parameter. So, if we now take the little bit of show, what I showed you about the black carbon, a little bit about microbes, minerals, they all darken the surface. And I'll show you here a variety of things, but how do you actually measure the albedo properties of these? Well, you measure albedo either on the ground on 25 20 by 25 centimeters or 50 by 50 centimeters, or you use a bunch of uh, airborne uh, means to fly at 100 meters to measure it at 100 by 100 meters or 200 by 250, and then you link that to satellite. And this is a work by Joe Cook and Andrew Tadstone, where we show that just using a radiative transport models, Actually, the clean snow to high algal biomass reduction in albedo can be very nicely modeled based on the data that we have from the surface of the Greenland ice sheet in 
the Western margin. The reduction is very dramatic. And when we measure it in green snow, we get an albedo. Remember, albedo was one when it's perfect. In green snow, it goes down to 0.8 all the way to 0.5. In red snow, it goes 0.8 to 0.45. And in purple ice, it goes down to 0.35. So obviously, the more melting you have, the more algae to grow. The more algae grow, the more melting you'll have, the lower the albedo. So the effect of the red snow alone is 13%. And this was in Steffi's paper in Nature, Nature Comms. And the ice algae effect is about 13 to 15%. But in locally, we actually go up to 26%, so more than a quarter of increase in melting rate. And this is in, in Andrew Totstone's and Joe Cook's papers in 2017, 18, and 20. So all these algae, they have a positive feedback on the melting. And you can look at that at the big scale now, because you can say, well, if I look back in time, I can actually use the information which I have from satellites and predict forward the amount of area which will be covered more and more by algae. And this is now from 20, 20, 2000 to 2016, where you actually can actually see this increase very dramatically. So what, what do we have? Well, we have algae, let's say mineral dust, black carbon, they lower the albedo, they increase the melting. You have a positive feedback between algal growth, albedo reduction, and melting, but actually the phosphorus itself is actually driving that. That means the mineral microbe interaction is very important, and all that leads to sea level rise. So in all this work, we have we know that it happens, we know that they lower albedo, but we still don't know how it happens. We don't know what triggers the blooms. We don't know what happens in winter. We don't know how the transition from snow to ice actually is rate-wise determining. We don't know what the carbon budget is and what the climate effect and consequences are, and still how to put this in the models. So with the purple, we now will, we have spent in 2019 and 20, we spent part in these two plots here, dots, and next year we are at the moment scheduling to go to other two plots and eventually we go to see whether this process happens everywhere in Greenland. And what do we do? Well, we look at start with winter, that means we take ice cores and what you see here, is the snow cover. This is the snow ice interface. This is an ice core which is blown up here. And you see these different sections, and these are full with algae. These are all the ice algae and in part snow algae which are frozen in in the winter. Now, the snow algae very often lose their pigmentation because the xanthophils and the carotenoids, they actually degrade. But interestingly, the ice algae with the purpuragallin, they don't lose their pigmentation, but we don't know what triggers their beginning. So we don't know what goes from snow and from ice. How do we go from there? How is this transition happening? So what we're starting to do, we take these ice cores, and this is work of Ray, uh, Ray Moreau, PhD student in my group, where we take the ice cores and actually we use cryo, a lot of cryo technologies to actually analyze the samples in the field, in the ice cores themselves, not in the field, sorry, in the ice cores themselves, because we have noticed that once we melt them, we actually lose the information about what happens actually on the surface. So we have ice cores which we collected at the snow ice interface or ice cores that we collected from the melting surface. That means we look at cryotomography and cryo SEM and cryo TM to understand the distribution and the linkages between these uh, uh, rearrangement during melting and try to understand also nutrient distribution accumulation as a function of seasonality. Only if we understand what happens before melting and during melting, can we understand the weathering crust? And I'm sorry, the, the reference here is Cooper et al. Has, been, has disappeared. But what you see here is a schematic of a surface of the ice. These are ice crystals and little water pools. So if we want to understand how this develops and how the algal blooms actually change this, it's not trivial because it's a mixture of hydrology, geochemistry, mineralogy, albedo measurements and reconstructions in three dimensions. So together with the CT and with the microscopy, we may actually get there. Lastly, we still have a huge proportion of unresolved questions. We have scratched the surface. We know a little bit about what the carbon is, what, they, what, what is getting delivered, but we actually don't know about the process and the mechanism itself. So this is a big part of the deep purple where we look at everything from any kind of particulate or dissolved chemical and biological signal for carbon and or mineral nutrients 
we look at snow and ice specific signature, but particularly we look at seasonal and specifically also diurnal changes. Because whether you are doing it in the summer season where you have, so to speak, 24 hour sunlight, it's not quite, or you're looking at it in the winter, you want to see what happens to the dissolved in the particular phases, whether you're looking at organic geochemistry or doing network analysis, try to understand these processes as a whole. If you can do that, you can look at ice algae growth, weathering crust evolution and, and biomining, and that's the way you can actually get these things together and look at the darkening itself. So our next step started, and like I said, despite COVID, we have managed to get into the, uh, into the uh, field twice in 2020 and 2021. And we're trying to figure out how to make a, the contribution to further our, our albedo parameterization so that in a future world, which will happen invariably, the green and ice sheet, we can predict better where we're going. Because the future is today. And in last July, we had uh, in one single day, Greenland lost 8.5 billion tons of ice. And I made a calculation this morning, I'm not sure if that's correct, but I think it's about 30 meters of ice covering Berlin, which has a surface area of 890 meters. London is 1,500 kilo, uh, square kilometers, so it would be 15 meters of ice over London in one single day. And it's not a unusual thing. It's actually happening multiple times. This was the exceptional one in 2012. And this is 2021, but we had high values in, in 2019. We had high values in many of the years. So this is not something which doesn't happen. Remember those 3,300 gigatons of ice? In 35 years, the Greenland ice sheet has lost 5,500 gigatons of ice just in 35 years and not in 10,000 years when you see before. But in these 35 years, we added already, just from Greenland, 1.5 centimeters of global average sea level. Do we want to go here in the two to three degrees? We don't know. This is what happens three a million years ago. And actually, we don't want to go there because we don't know how it happens. And many of you have seen that at COP, there was a cryosphere pavilion. They raised code red from Earth's climate. We know that we must act now, but we are kind of uh, terrible at doing so as a humanity, especially looking at the way we behave just with the little problem that we have at the moment. So with that, I want to finish and thank you for questions. So th thanks very much, Sarah. That was an absolutely fascinating talk about a really exciting um, campaign of field research. Um, 